Camera check. Cam rolling. Sound check. Sound rolling. Broadcast check. Connection. Hello, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Live on Facebook. And today I'm going to do some Q&A. So if you've got any questions, photography related, I won't give personal marital advice or any of that sort of stuff. Um, but photography related questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. So fire those in. I've got an iPad here and the questions you send in will come in onto this iPad and I will pick out the best ones. Now, before we kick off, I'm gonna just let you know, today I'm gonna to talk about a bit of kit actually. I've got a few bits and pieces to talk about here. I've also got to talk about this amazing new photography book here, which I'm gonna to come to uh, shortly as well. A few other little bits and pieces on my list, which should entertain us and keep us fulfilled for the next 20 or 30 minutes. Now, let's um, start off. One thing, first of all, is, um, I don't know if any of you've heard, but Facebook have changed their algorithms lately, uh, especially for pages like ourselves or business pages, where we're just not getting as many views or coming into as many people's feeds as we used to because of these changes. Now, to do us a favor, to help us with that, if you can share these live shows, um, if you can like our little live broadcasts, share them, tell your friends about them, then hopefully it will improve our rankings and we can continue to do them because obviously um, when we used to do these, we were getting thousands and thousands and thousands of views and people are enjoying them and, and since they've changed those algorithms, it's changed a little bit and we don't want to be broadcasting to hardly anyone, otherwise it's not worth doing, is it? So uh, so you can help us out by um, sharing um, if, uh, if you could, that would be immensely appreciated thank you so much now i'm going to take some questions um i'll take a couple of questions now and then i'm going to move on to something else and then i'm going to come back to taking questions then i'm going to move on to something else because quite a few bits to cover here now we've got a question here from claire roundtree hello claire how are you hi carl what easily portable lighting setup could you recommend for travel portrait photography well you can go a couple of ways Claire you can go the most portable route which is speed lights and a friend of mine a photographer Alex Wallace um, you can find him under alexwallace.co.nz he was also a guest on one of our live talk shows and explained his techniques he uses uh, three or four high powered speed lights and he's got them all linked up together um, with the, uh, they, they can talk to each other basically, and he can control them from a, 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 some device and, and link them all together. And he uses speed lights through umbrellas or speed lights into silver umbrellas and bounces them back, or even through uh, scrim rolls, which is what I've got here. You can't see it, but there's a light shining through a scrim roll here. Um, now, that's the sort of basic kit and it's the most compact and you can put these speed lights on lighting stands and he's basically got a long bag with four lighting stands, all his speed lights, spare batteries, triggers and all that, all on wheels on a little kit, get it on a plane, no problem and uh, off he goes. So it depends, um, you know, how involved you want to get. For me personally, I'd want something a little more pokey. So if I was say going on assignment or I wanted to go and photograph some amazing tribe or culture in a foreign country, I'd like to have a big long extension stick to hold a soft box, maybe a, a large octa box. And I'd probably put um, something like a Moby light, a bronze color Moby light in there connected to a move pack because it's got a lot more power, a lot more punch, 
but obviously comes at a price. Um, when I've been shooting on location with uh, fashion projects, I've used the Moby lights with a couple of move packs, gives me all the juice and all the power I want, plus I can use all my standard modifiers, paras, soft boxes, etc., etc. So it really does depend on your budget, but speed lights is the smallest, most compact, not necessarily the cheapest anymore because even high quality speed lights can cost, you know, 600 bucks or more per speed light. So you're starting to get into the realms of uh, studio lighting and mobile studio lighting pricing as well. The other one that I like, uh, there's the Ellenchrom Ranger packs and there's the Broncolor Cirrus, um, all good systems. Right, Guy Dunn says, do you calibrate your lenses? Simple answer, Guy. No, I don't. Uh, generally, I'm shooting uh, medium format Hasselblad lenses. They don't need calibrating. I've tried the calibration on my Canon lenses. Didn't really notice any improvement. It's like a focus calibration. No harm in doing it, but if you do it, put your camera on a tripod, photograph a fixed object, shoot at full open aperture so you can really identify the sweet spot of the focus and do it that way. There's no point trying to calibrate your lenses if you're not all locked down and your subject's locked down. So do it in a very scientific process. Um, British Pokal says, what is your opinion on the X1D? Uh, which of its versions do you recommend? Well, there is only one version of the X1D. There is a limited edition version, but I don't think it's, it's not any different to the current version. It's a fantastic camera. I've got so many questions coming here. I can't keep up. Right. It's a fantastic camera. Amazing uh, quality. It's got the same 50 megapixel chip that's in the H6 50 CMOS. Um, and it, it, the lenses and the quad, I've used it, it is superb, but you know, it's not, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a hugely expensive camera when you compare it to the top end DSLRs. It is more expensive, but you are getting more for your money in image quality. Um, right, next question. Zahid Bashir, can we use Canon lenses with Nikon camera? No, I don't think you can. Completely different mount, completely different fitting. So uh, no, um, and if you had some sort of adapter to convert them, that would create a space, which would then become like an extension tube, which would then change the focusing, which wouldn't work. April Keller, what is the best freelance photography site to use? What does that mean, April? Freelance photography site to use for what? What is a freelance photography site? I don't understand the qu question, April. Very sorry, can't answer the question. Kevin Lamb, which photographers inspired you to take it up? Um, I uh, was a big fan of a guy called Bob Carlos Clark when I was young. He was a sort of fashion, black and white photographer. He used to do really sexy, beautiful black and white images, quite provocative, some of, some of them. Uh, unfortunately, Bob Carlos Clark committed suicide some years back. Um, Brilliant photographer though. Uh, Litchfield was another one. Steve McCurry used to follow when I was a kid all the way th through looking at National Geographic. Sam Abel, Jodie Cobb at National Geographic. Uh, I love Rankin's work. Tim Flack is another uh, good one that I love. He was on our talk show uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, so there are lots of them. I get inspired all the time. Um, now, talking of inspiration, I'm going to come back to these questions in a moment, guys. But talking of inspiration, this is a new book it is called Photography by the Letter. Photography by the Letter. By Jeffrey Sidoris, who is a good friend of mine. And Jeffrey would not describe himself as a professional photographer. He's a professional multimedia artist. And what he does brilliantly is design. Uh, I mean, his design work is amazing. So he's done this beautifully illustrated book on photography that has got such amazing uh, graphics in it, such beautiful design. And it is an A to Z of everything from photography. And it's obviously called photography by the letter. So you literally start at the letter A all the way through to the letter Z. He said he had trouble finding something for the letter Y. You start at the letter A, go all the way through to the letter Z and it's got terminology, not just one, but several of all things photography. So it's like a glossary on photography. And it is an incredible book, an incredible resource, whether you're a beginner or a pro. And I found it extremely interesting as a sort of reference guide on every sort of detail of photography. I mean, let's just call out a couple here, like prism, for example, panorama, pow, optical zoom, neutral density filters, noise, Newton rings, negative, motion blur, manual mode, medium format, 
Kelvin, all of these uh, incident light, um, golden ratio, all of these like grains. So all of these things in alphabetical order making up this beautifully illustrated book. And there's this quote on the back from this guy. It says, photography by the letter is a visual treat, a superbly illustrated reference guide that will be loved by new photographers and welcome addition to the book collection of many seasoned pros. Carl Taylor wrote that quote. So it must be a good book. It must be a good book. Now, if you're interested, where can you get this book? I'm, I'm going to show you where you can get this book. Let me just bring it up on screen. This is where you can get the book. JeffreySadoris.com. J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S.com. That's where you can see more about the book, learn more about the book. It's really well priced. It's a beautiful book, great gift for any photographers in your life or even for yourself. Jeffrey uh, is a great guy. He actually does uh, consultant design work for us and he's a wonderful um, enthusiast on, photographer, uh, on photography and um, he's a great ambassador for the art. So check that book out and take a look at it. Right, moving on, let's take some more questions. We've got so many questions coming in here, we might have to do a second show. Right. Um, Nick Andrews. Hi, Carl. My wife is looking at getting the Sigma 150 to 600 for wild animal photography. They're also a Tamron version. Do you have any thoughts on a good telephoto lens for a reasonable budget for this kind of work? I'm afraid, Nick's not my area of expertise. Um, I, 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 Sigma and Tamron are both good brands, okay? Sigma have got a good range of art lenses that everyone's raving about. Tamron lenses I've used years and years ago. They, you know, these, these lenses now are better than some of the top lenses of 10 years ago because lens design and you know the design of making a lens and things has improved so much in the last 10 years. So I don't think you really need to worry too much. I'd say read the reviews online, look at what they say in the camera magazines, see what you think, but I'm not an expert on, on that stuff. So you're gonna probably find out more information from me, but I can tell you those two brands are absolutely fine. Samuel Bronson, hi Carl, for studio shots, do you prefer the Sony or your Hasselblad? Come on, okay? Of course the Hasselblad. I use a H6 100C, uh, it's a new camera. As a matter of fact, this is my old Hasselblad, my H5. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute because I've got an amazing deal on this for you guys, if you're interested. Um, I use my Hasselblad. The tonal range on a Hasselblad is so much smoother than any 35 mil camera, I'm afraid, because it's got a giant, massive, whacking, great medium format chip that is huge, so the physics of it mean that it's going to be uh, a, a better camera. We do have a Sony, here's one. I'm gonna talk about something on this in a minute. I do like the Sony, I think the Sony's really good. If you're curious, um, Samuel, I did a YouTube video comparing the Sony to the H6, and I've got some results of using the new Nikon D850 against the Hasselblad H6100, and that Nikon is awesome, and it still didn't come close to the Hasselblad, but it was awesome, it was awesome. Anyway, moving on. Carlo Savan, I don't know what your last name is, Carlo. Advice for working with large animals such as horses in a studio situation. Uh, don't upset them, don't get in the way, don't get trodden on. Make sure your equipment is safe. Um, hopefully the horse would have gone to the toilet before it came into your studio. I don't know of really what other advice to offer on that. Um, you'd be better looking at Tim Flack's work. Tim Flack, uh, who as, as I said was on our talk show, and if you'd like to learn some tips from him, check out on our live show pages. Uh, let, me, let me just bring that up a second, Ben. Uh, here we are, here's our live show pages, and you can see some of our, our live shows that are coming up here listed. There's Tim Flack, you can watch that replay on that show. Tim is an expert at shooting uh, animals, and he's done a book on horses called Equus, uh, Equus or whatever it was called, uh, beautiful book, and um, he gave loads of tips uh, on the show. Um, you know, obviously, it's a large object. You gotta look at the reflectance off of the skin, the fur, controlling the animal, the posing, how, what you're going to do with your background. Um, but if you're, if you're at a stage where you're bringing a horse into your studio, then I think you'll be able to figure it out. Jamie Jones, what fabric is best for use on backdrops when it comes to portrait photography indoors? Well, if you want a good black, then black velvet is the best light absorbing to get solid black. If you're on the cheap, then black felt can work if you put it at a distance. Um, and 
for other backdrops, generally because I'm doing mostly product photography, if we bring up, uh, let me bring up my website, if I can find it. Hold on, let's get back to here a second. Uh, right, let's bring up my website here. So if we go to my sort of work, which is a lot of fashion and a lot of beauty, but I mean, these sort of backgrounds here are backgrounds that I've painted. Okay, so I paint a lot of backgrounds uh, and create my own backgrounds, painting smooth walls or smooth boards um, to make my own backgrounds. Or I use the cove background, but on a lot of my object photography, these are just white boards with a light on them. Like, for example, this one here is a, is a piece of hardboard that I painted brown. So I'm using smooth boards and painting them with emulsion paint, matte paint, which gives me a nice smooth finish. If you need a bigger area, you can paint a bigger flat wall. Or if you're talking about taking backgrounds, then you can use canvases and paint canvases. Um, you can use paper rolls, but I'm not a fan of paper roll backgrounds because you get a lot of ripples in them. They're good when they're new, but after a time they can sag and it causes sort of ripples to appear on them, um, so I'm not, not a big fan. Um, right, what's the next one? Tom Feeney Evan, I'm fairly experienced small studio photographer. I really found your recent business portrait are very useful. Any chance on one on action shots with movement to freeze, say, kung fu fighters or dancers or similar? Show us how to get the subject movement and then freeze at key moment. Well, actually, you'll be keen to know, Tom, that we've got some new fashion tutorials uh, coming up. Let me show you some pictures from that. And um, we've got movement, although, although, she, uh, although they may look static in here, let me just bring up a couple of these. So we have got the model actually moving and spinning and showing you how we've, like she's swinging on a, on a swing there. So all of these modules on these new fashion shots are coming soon. We start releasing these uh, this week, I believe, and then we'll be releasing them thereafter. So we've got lots of new great fashion tutorials. And the other thing as well, um, Tom, is that we've already got modules in our fashion section on freezing models in action and moving and stuff. So um, you want to go and check out some of that for uh, similar style stuff. And it's the same whether it's liquids or other stuff that we've got as well in, uh, in carltaylereducation.com. You can find information about how to do that already. And we've got um, an amazing chapter on fast flash duration and learning all about that. Um, Andrew Hall says, hi, Carl. Is it possible to shoot high sync speed for action shots, say a boxer, punching a bag and capturing the sweat beads flying off with normal basic flash guns. Uh, yes, it is, Andrew, it is. Um, as a matter of fact, right, before I started with Bron Color gear, because I, I bought Bron Color gear, which is my, my gear of choice, but I bought Bron Color gear because of its amazing fast flash duration and it's got a lot of power. But before I bought that gear, I was doing a lot uh, of high-speed liquid shots. Here's a great example. Like this one here was done with speed lights. So you can do it with speed lights. Speed lights have a really fast flash duration when they're on low power. You can actually get like 20,000th or 30,000th of a second out of a speed light, but you can only get it out of it at low power. So you have to dial the, in manual mode, you have to dial the power right down low and then it will have the fast flash duration, but then you haven't got much power, which is why I switched to bronze color because you have more power with the speed. But what I used to do was I used to put three or four speed lights together in a cluster and fire them as one with triggers. And then I'd have a batch there and a batch there, and then I'd get the fast flash duration. And by multiplying the speed lights, I'd have enough power. But that became ludicrously complicated. You had to rely on the triggers, then you had to buy all the speed lights. And even if you bought cheap ones, it still added up in cost. And they were unreliable generally. So in, in what you're asking is, yes, it is possible, but it's just not efficient. OK, right, next question. Amini Kadari, hope I said that right. Hi Carl, what lens can I use for sharp product photography? 80 millimeter fixed prime lens would be my choice. That's what I used on the Hasselblad 80 mil. That's equivalent to about 50 mil on um, a 35 mil camera. I also use 100 mil, which is equivalent to an 85 mil. I'd go with a prime lens as well, so fixed prime lens. Next question, Dia Amen, how to learn food styling in a professional way for food photography? <laughs> do you recommend any book or YouTube channel to watch? No, I do not. I recommend you head over to 
carltaylereducation.com, you jump into our product section, which is just here, if it will load up, there we go, and you take a look at these amazing food photography and styling courses we've got here with the wonderful Anna Pushtinikova, who is a professional food stylist and photographer, and these amazing hours and hours and hours of top lessons we've got on food photography. That's what I recommend you do. Right, now, moving on. Let's talk about something else. I'm going to take some more questions in a moment. Let's have a look at something else. I want to jump onto the subject of um, tilt and shift, right? See this thing? Many of you may have heard of tilt and shift lenses. These are lenses you can get for Canon or Nikon that allow you to tilt the lens separately to the camera body, okay? And you use it to correct converging angles for architectural photography, but you can also use it for product photography. Now, Hasselblad don't do a tilt and shift lens. What they do do is a tilt and shift adapter. So they've got this adapter that you can then put the, um, the lens on the front of the adapter, like so, and now, now I can tilt the lens. Let me see if I can show you that. So now, look, I can tilt the lens downwards or I can tilt the lens upwards. There you go. And I can raise the lens up and down. So basically, if we look at it sideways, you can see how that lens is pointing right upwards now. So that's a tilt and shift adapter for their system. And what that allows you to do is to do shots like this. Um, this is one I did the other week, and it allows you to get an immense depth of field all the way from your foreground, all the way through to the background, which you would not be able to do without a tilt and shift adapter unless you employed focus stacking, which I'm gonna to come to in a second. But you can see here this immensely sharp image all the way from the bottom, all the way through, all the way to the back. And that's afforded because of the tilt and shift adapter. And it's really easy to do it with a tilt and shift adapter or with a um, tilt and shift lens. And it allows you to get these super, super sharp shots all the way through. Now, this shot though here, oh, if I can get my thing to work, this one, there you go, this one I did with focus stacking, okay? So this one, would have worked with a tilt and shift adapter, but I just decided to do it a different way. And we just jump back to that one. So if we have a look at this shot, this is an Im immensely high macro shot. Well, it's not a high macro shot, but it was shot on a 100 megapixel camera and it allowed me to go right in. So this was on the H6 100. This is a low res version of the file as well. I could go in even more than this. This is just a low res JPEG of it. But I could have done that with a tilt and shift adapter and it would have made my life easier because I could have done it in one go. But on that one, I did it with focus stacking. So you can do this a couple of ways, but the reason I bring this up is because next Monday, um, we've got uh, an architectural photographer called Sean Conboy coming on our live talk show. And this is, this, is, this is the talk show. It's next Monday, the 26th of March at 1800 GMT. I can never get the buttons right on this new Mac. Look at this, I keep pressing it, it keeps doing stuff. Right now, Sean is coming on the show. This is the blog post. If you wanna go and have a look at some of Sean's amazing work. So Sean travels all over the world shooting these amazing um, architectural shots. Um, he does hotels and uh, luxury cruise liners and all sorts of stuff. So if you're interested in architectural photography, interiors photography, um, or exteriors architectural photography, uh, and knowing all the top tips on, on how to get these amazing images and uh, you know the techniques of lighting these images. I mean, you know, look at this. I mean, some of these images that Sean has to light with all this amazing detail in it. Now, Sean is someone who uses what's called a technical camera. So it's a bit like this thing, but it's actually a camera. It's like the camera we used to use in the old days, like a box thing. It looks like one of those, what are those instruments called that you, an accordion, they look like an accordion. Right? You've got the film at the back or the digital sensor that you put the digital sensor on the back of the thing and then you've got the lens plate at the front and you can tilt and rise and do all this and you've got different lens plates that you put on. Now these things, view cameras or technical cameras, uh, are what architectural and even some product photographers use to capture these amazing images. Now Sean's going to be on the show next Monday and he's going to be talking all about his top tips for architectural photography. So if you'd like to join us, head over to carltaylereducation.com. For those of you that are members obviously you'll be there you can join in the chat ask Sean questions if you're not a member already it's only $14 to join which is £12 if you're in the UK um, so it's extremely cheap 
we've got all the back courses. You can watch all our back live shows, all our other courses. It's all accessible to you just for £12 a month. Can't say fairer than that. Cancel online anytime. So you could sign up for one month, check it out, and then knock it on the head if you don't like it. Can't say fairer than that, all right? But give it a go, check it out. If you're into architectural interiors, come and see Sean in action next Monday. Right, let's take some more questions before I move on to the amazing deal I've got for you. An amazing deal to do with Hasselblad cameras. I'm gonna, I'm not giving these away, of course, but you're gonna be amazed at what I'm gonna tell you. So just hang on there a second. Right, next question. Um, blah, 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 blah. Larry Dillon, any recommended books on photography techniques? No, Larry, none at all, I'm afraid. CarlTaylorEducation.com, that's where you wanna go. Or photography by the letter, but this isn't techniques, this is just sort of glossary of information, but it does give you good information. But for techniques, you wanna head over to our channel. That's where you wanna go. Of course, there's loads of great books out there. I don't really buy photography books on techniques, I buy books for inspirational, so I buy books, like I bought Tim Flax, Endangered, I've got Rankin's books, I've got books that I buy for inspiration. I don't, you know, really need to focus on the techniques because I'm teaching techniques. Okay, next question. Thinly, thin, Tinley, do you think that's Tinley or Thinley? Guy Alston. Hi, what do you do, Carl, if I buy Sony Alpha 7R? Is it worth using Canon lens adapting with Metabone with Sony camera? No, I don't think it is. I think if you're gonna go for Sony, like this one, and go for the Sony lenses, I mean, the Sony lenses are really good. We use them for video. So we use this Sony A7 as a video camera, and we love the Sony lenses. I think they are amazing. And actually, that brings me on nicely to this thing. We got sent this to test, and like most of the stuff we get sent to test, it goes in the bin because it's usually rubbish. Um, or we've got someone begging us to show something that we don't like. So we never talk about or endorse anything we don't like. But if we do like something, then we'll give it a mention. Now this is called the finger zoom, okay? You clip it around your lens a bit like a bracelet and it's got this lever so you can zoom your lens. Now we tried it and it actually works quite well. So the idea is if you're shooting and you don't want to like, you know, zoom like this, like you have to zoom like this, you can do it more sort of conveniently like this. I haven't got it on the zoom ring, by the way. I've got it on the focus ring and I'll explain why, but you'd have it on the zoom ring and then you'd be able to do it here and here. So you'd be able to move your zoom like this in, a, in, a, in an easier and smoother way. But what I found this thing amazing for is because we do a lot of video and we do a lot of focus pulls where we pull focus from one object to another object, it's always really difficult pulling focus when you're turning it like this. But this little device was amazing for doing focus pulls from one point to another. Because when we do a focus pull, we mark a point on the lens with a bit of tape saying, right, we're going from that focus position to here. And then with this thing, it just made it so much smoother and so much easier. So this is the finger zoom. I don't know where you can get it. Look it up online. I can't remember. Finger zoom, F I N. NGA, American, clearly they don't know how to spell because I thought finger was spelled F-I-N-G-E-R. But there we go. Maybe it's just for fun. Maybe they called it finger zoom like that for fun. So there we are, finger zoom. Check it out if you want one of those. I thought that was a nifty little product. Right, now let me bring you on to this thing about Hasselblad. Now let's take one more question. Um, who, who, we, he, who, we, he says, Carl, why do you choose Guernsey, a small island in the English Channel Sea, for your commercial photography business over London, a traditionally much more international cities for pro photographers? Well, that's a good question, Ho Wee He. Let me answer it first of all. We are actually in, it is called the English Channel, but we are in the uh, Bay of Normandy. We're very close to France, about 30 kilometres from France. Uh, but we're only a 35 minute flight from London and uh, I have to go to London quite a bit and I just get on a plane, boom. And I can get into London quicker from here to central London than some people who live on the suburbs of London can get into London. So it's not an inconvenience and most photographers that work in London, they don't have their own studio. They have to rent a studio at about 1,200 pounds a day in London, do the client work and rack up there, rent the lighting and all the rest of it. I've got my own studio here, got a huge amount of space. 
I live on a beautiful island surrounded by the ocean. I love diving and fishing and all that stuff. So uh, I get to do those things. It's a great place for my two young kids to grow up. And I was born here. So I just decided to come back and live here. Uh, and I love it. And that's the answer. So I can get to London quickly when I need to. Um, and because most of the stuff I photograph is small product photography, people can ship it to me anyway, so it's no problem. Right, uh, and also I don't like cities. I'm not a city boy, right? I need to be by the ocean, otherwise I go crazy. I'm in London, right? If I'm there for more than a week, I go nuts, okay? I get claustrophobic and I go nuts. Right, now, what Brian Stricker says, hey Carl, I'm in the middle of getting a garage built and we'll have a second floor as a studio space. What do you recommend for walls and floor? Well, I mean, our floor's concrete and our walls are just normal rendered. So you need smooth walls are good because if you render them smooth, you can paint them and use them as backgrounds or use them as reflectors. And uh, for a floor, I mean, the concrete floor, it's not obviously the most comfortable to walk on, but it's the easiest to roll things around on and for filming and shooting. So a smooth screed concrete floor painted with Dulux floor shield and then painted with white emulsion matte paint on top of it. You have to constantly paint it every month to keep it clean, but there you go. Right, let's move on. Um, right, okay. This Hasselblad, this wonderful Hasselblad H5, which is responsible for many amazing images like these, and I say amazing, even, even calling my own work amazing, that's a little bit arrogant of me. Many of these images were shot on this camera. Nearly, well, actually, most of these images, because I've only had the H6 for a while, a uh, short while, but most of these images have been shot on this camera here, okay? This wonderful H5. Now, I put this up for sale for £6,000 without the lens, and people thought it was a bit too expensive, and it probably was based on market uh, value. This is the H550 CCD model, not the CMOS model. This is the CCD model. So this only works well at 50 ISO, works okay at 100 ISO, but above that doesn't work so good. So it's really more of a studio camera, but a beautiful camera with a very large chip, beautiful tonal range, and for studio images, product images, or portrait work, or fashion work, it is gorgeous. Now, I am now, because of a time waster who wasted my time back and forth over, yes, I wanted it, don't want it, yes, I want it, blah, blah, blah. Forget about them, gone, right? Now, I'm offering it with an 80 millimeter lens. I looked up on a secondhand lens store. This lens is worth $1,000 secondhand on its own, okay? So I'm now throwing in an 80 mil lens on the H5. I'm also gonna throw in the film back that I found. So if you're into film photography, you can swap the back over and use film on it. I'm not sure you can use that back on here. I think you can, but if you can't, I'm also throwing in a H1. Can you believe it? A 22 megapixel H1 Hasselblad. It'd be worth buying it just so you had this for the trade-in value on another one, okay? So I'm going to sell my H5 with an 80 millimeter lens and a 22 megapixel H1D with a film back, all of it for 6,000 pounds. For those of you who don't know what pounds are, go on Google currency converter and type it in and that's what it will be in your currency. So if you're interested in purchasing that, uh, because if you're not, I'm gonna sell it to some, one of the camera stores soon, but if any of you are interested in purchasing that amazing bundle, then um, email us at, um, through my business, carltaylorportfolio.com site. You'll find uh, my email on the uh, contact page. Right, now, this is telling me I've got 10% battery left, so I might have to do something there in a second. But uh, let's have a look. Next question. Uh, Alan says, what tripod head for recommended for installing Hasselblad H6D in portrait position? Um, well, I use the, the, what's it, the RC4, is it the ball head? No, I can't remember. We use one of the big Manfrotto ball heads and it's strong enough. Uh, but generally in the studio, I use the geared head. I think it's the mini geared head 410 from Manfrotto. And I love that geared head. It's a great geared head. Right, glass of water. Mm. Right, oh, I just need to say a congratulation as well to our competition winners. If you didn't see this the other day, some of uh, our members who were able to enter our competition, these were the three uh, finalists. There was this one, this was the winner, and there was this beautiful shot. And they all won 
They all won amazing prizes. One of them won an $800 Manfrotto tripod. Can you believe it? And what did we give away three months before that? We gave away a Canon 5D Mark IV as our first prize in the competition just a few months ago. And uh, that was won um, by a wonderful image as well. Of course, we run these competitions every quarter. Every, four competitions a year, these big competitions with big prizes. Our next giveaway, our next prize giveaway, is a bronze color Cirrus lighting kit with two Cirrus lamp heads, a bag, soft boxes. It's worth like five, what is it worth? $5,000 or something. We're giving that away as the prize in the next competition. So if you've got some great imagery, what is, uh, oh no, no, anyway, where, I don't know when the date is, but it doesn't matter, but it's, it's the next competition. If you want to enter the competition, head over to carltaylereducation.com and check it out. Closes on June the 10th, that competition. So you guys, if you want to have a chance of winning a bronze color Cirrus lighting kit worth thousands of dollars, head over to Carl Taylor, that's K-A-R-L Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R, education.com. Check out the amazing stuff we've got going on over there. Right, let's take a, more, a few more questions before we wrap this up. Um, Chris Hurst, any plans to do Hollywood style portrait tutorials with Fresnel lights? Yes, we do, Chris. That is on the agenda because um, I, I know that's popular and it's not difficult to do actually. I do them, I've done them a lot personally for my own reasons, but um, we should do a tutorial on that. Um, right, where's, where, my, my question's jumping all over the place. I've just got, got things popping. I don't want that. Get rid of that. Go away. Right, uh, all right, Emma, you're gonna have to come and solve this now because look, this is my level of technology expertise. I can't get rid of that stupid thing. Right, okay. thank you. Right, there you go. Look at my wonderful technological skills. I had to get someone to come and help me with an iPad. How um, untechnological am I? Right, um, Bob Brooks says, how do you not get branding on your images from your website? Oh, banding, banding, right. Um, well, we, we, you basically put some extra noise in. If you work on the image in 16-bit in TIFF mode or PSD mode first, 16-bit images, if it's shot on a high-bit camera, and if you um, make sure you work on it in 16-bit the whole way through, if you do get banding, add a little bit of noise. Put a little 1% of noise in. Um, right, who we got here? Victor. Hi, shooting full resolution, the quality of the images are amazing, but resizing them for media sites, the quality get very bad. Any help to look better? I don't have any problem resizing images. Um, I resize my images in Photoshop CC. Used to be a time that you used to have to, if you had taken a huge image, like 100 megapixel, or 50 megapixel image, and you were bringing it down to social media size, that you used to have to resize it in stages to get it down. But now with the whatever it is, bicubic sharpening or smoothing for reduction in images, I can just put in the final size I want it to go to, and I can't tell the difference. I've tested going down in stages compared to resizing in one go. It looks the same to me. Um, so I've not had any issue. Um, Jan Folkrovic says, what kind of resolution is normal for ad work these days? I'd say 50 megapixel, um, medium, if you're, talking main, you know, if you're talking big advertising work, big campaigns, then they're gonna expect medium format 50 megapixel. Some stuff is done on 35 uh, mil. Um, Tim Flack was telling me the other day that he uses a, a Canon 5DR for some of his work, which is a 50 megapixel camera, and it did give good results. Um, so, but I'd say 50 megapixels the minimum. Right, um, Dennis um, says, hello, Mr. Taylor, thanks for your DVD set after 15 years in photojournalism, I started my own photography business. Do you have any uh, tutorials about photographing for museums and art paintings? Uh, we have just filmed one actually, uh, a small short one on that. Not gonna be published just yet because we've got a rack of other stuff being published, but it's within carltaylereducation.com. It will be there in due course. Uh, Andrew Rank says, hi Carl, do you recommend the Canon 5D Mark 1V. Um, I, do, I can recommend Canon as a brand, fantastic brand. We use Canons, but I'm not really knowledgeable about the ins and outs of each particular model camera. I know the 5DS or whatever it is, the 5D 50 megapixel one. I know the 5D Mark IV. I know the 5D Mark III's, but that's about it, I'm afraid. But, um, you know, we're not the best place for reviews on kit. 
The best place for reviews on kit is usually sort of blogging websites or photography magazines. Tony, uh, Tom Mellum says, do you use LED panels for your shoots sometimes? No, I don't, Tom, I'm afraid. I don't really find them versatile enough. You have to be very careful with LED panels that they've got a high color index, okay? It's called the CRI, that's the color index. If it's not above 93, 94, you don't have the full spectrum of light. And if you're missing part of the spectrum, you will never reproduce the colors accurately in your pictures. You need flash, sunlight, or HMI lighting to get full spectrum, beautiful, clean, full spectrum lighting. And um, LEDs have come a long, long way, but they haven't come all the way in my opinion. Then you've got the problem that an LED panel to be bright enough needs to be sort of a broad box with lots and lots of lights in, but then it's still quite a hard light source. So yes, you can shine it through diffusion material, but can you easily mount a soft box? You can't put it in a para, you can't put it in a parabolic uh, reflector uh, like, like those ones over there. So it's not versatile enough. Great for video work, just setting one up for doing video interviews and quick stuff like that. But for mainstream photography, for portraiture, for product photography, I'm not convinced. Next one. Kunal Daswani says, Para 88 or 133, if you could only afford one, Para 133 for sure. It's one of my favorite lighting modifiers. It is the most versatile, beautiful portrait, beauty, fashion modifier. Um, Mohammed, Lightroom or Photoshop? Um, Photoshop for me, because Photoshop can do everything that Lightroom can do. Uh, Lightroom can't do everything that Photoshop can do. But anyway, Photoshop CC, uh, nine pound a month, $10 a month, you get both. So you don't have to choose. There you go. Right, is that it? Are we done here? Is my work done? Doesn't look like there's any more questions. I thank you all for tuning in. Remember, if you enjoyed it, share it, like it. Tell Facebook to stuff their algorithm up their Facebook passage. And um, make sure we get more views. And we can do this more often. Thank you for tuning in. If anyone wants to buy this Hasselblad stuff here, let me know. We'll do a deal. See you next time.